Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. I just returned from China. No, just kidding. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, explainable AI uh, and a specific work called the uh, past future mutual information that uh, actually measure uh, the information between uh, a two time series. Uh, and the talk will be basically I'll give some kind of uh, motivation, although I think that it's quite clear, and some of the XAI approaches. The first part is more qualitative and based on uh, KDD 2019 introduction and uh, some uh, later presentation related to that. And uh, then I'll move to uh, uh, the part that is based on the research that we had with uh, Yuval Shalev, uh, Amichai Pian Piansky and uh, uh, Aviv Notovich that is here with us. Uh, we'll discuss there uh, how we can uh, overcome some of those limitations uh, of uh, SHAP, which is one of the methods uh, in time series. And uh, basically, we'll show two models that we use to extract information uh, among time series. Um, so uh, XAI. Explainable AI is used in many directions and many areas. Uh, uh, medicine, uh, finance, legal, all, uh, uh, all the cases where someone has to explain the outcome of, uh, of a model. And uh, a trivial uh, example is that uh, a, you know, a physician obtain a certain output from an AI system. Uh, so in this case, uh, uh, a brain MRI image that uh, indicates that this patient has a, um, epilepsy, epilepsy with 85% uh, uh, probability or confidence. And the physician has to know why, why it was diagnosed that, that way and uh, can it trust that uh, type of uh, information. And th these things are being uh, uh, done today. So you can have uh, here an image of uh, a quantitative insight uh, uh, on a breast cancer uh, from uh, the inner eye project. And what you can see is uh, those pixels that are suspect suspected of being uh, um, uh, uh, malignals and, and those that are expected to be part of uh, uh, a benign uh, uh, type of uh, um, uh, pixels, and uh, this is part of the output that the physician will see, including the exact location of uh, uh, the tumor, potential tumor. Tumor, And similarly, another example is uh, uh, in legal cases where, for example, um, in a bank, uh, you have to uh, decide whether or not you'll give a, a loan or a mortgage to uh, a person, and the system uh, denies it or accepts it, and again, uh, the bankers to understand why uh, this was the reason. And of course, this raises a lot of legal uh, uh, points. We'll discuss it in a moment. And also here we have uh, real examples. Uh, this is a Bank of England uh, that uh, actually used the system to uh, um, learn six million samples of uh, mortgage ridge, and the idea was to find which one of them were uh, uh, were actually arrears and not. And you see here the basic uh, features uh, that represent both types of populations, those that uh, uh, finished the mortgage correctly and those that were not. So again, these are real examples happening. And, uh, as I mentioned, the XAI uh, is gaining attention due to uh, a lot of uh, um, cases uh, publicly known, uh, published in the paper about potential problems and challenges of uh, uh, AI systems. So the JP Morgan Chase uh, had a $55 million discrimination uh, settlement, and we all remember uh, um, Facebook, we are just here. The Zuckerberg uh, case with the political, I don't want to go back to yesterday, I'm trying to recover it. Um, <laughs> uh, there are cases with uh, Uber, of course, uh, uh, a known case of discrimination also related to uh, 
um, uh, to jailing. Uh, and, and the problem with the AI system is uh, often they learn from past, past data and uh, already there is a bias in the data and uh, uh, this, is, this becomes part of the model. You have to control it and there are new regulations that are addressing uh, discrimination and based on XAI system, discrimination against race, uh, sex, uh, uh, citizenship, age, whatever. And today there are a lot of efforts uh, in, uh, uh, in many large companies to uh, build in anti-discrimination features into those uh, systems in order to be able to uh, uh, explain those cases that uh, fall un un under sub some kind of a risk here. And uh, this is part of the JDPR of uh, uh, you know, the General Data Protection Regulation of the, U uh, of the uh, European uh, uh, countries as well as some California consumer privacy that, act for, that ask for fairness, transparency, privacy, and mainly for explainability. So in fact, any case that involves a specific decision about a person, whether or not he got a loan or were accepted uh, uh, to a certain program and so on, uh, cannot rely on a black box. The company has to be able to explain what were the reasons, the features that uh, are behind such a decision. And of course, when we talk about uh, very large databases with uh, sometimes hundreds of thousands of features, sometimes it's very hard to, uh, to, to approve it and to explain the reason, and this is exactly the case that uh, call for explainable AI. And the idea is uh, simple, instead of just giving where is the pointer here? No pointer. So just giving sheer recommendation to the user without him understanding what he should do. There is a, a also an explanation given to the user, trying to understand why those decisions were taken. And there is, a, in many cases, an option also for a feedback in order to, ex to improve those explainable AI products. So this is uh, the idea, and uh, it's not only uh, a decision of uh, whether or not to send a recommendation, but which type of recommendation to which user. So, for example, in, a, in an enterprise, uh, you know, the business owner would like to know if he can trust the AI system. Uh, the customer support would like to know what he will tell uh, the customers about a certain case. Uh, IT in operation might be interested to understand how they can debug the problem and so on and so forth. So uh, it's not enough to give an explanation, but it has to be relevant to the user. So all of it is um, under the name explainable AI and already as I showed before some examples are very good and nice uh, cases where uh, those XAI systems are implemented. This is a case of uh, NVIDIA PilotNet that um, where you apply a model uh, 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 on, on the vision and ask uh, to highlight those pixels or those areas that actually control the steering wheel uh, uh, um, recommendation, you see very well that it is related to the edges of the cars and of the, uh, you know, of the routes and so on. And when you do it to uh, uh, to other pictures, you get a very good chance to uh, actually um, debug the model. So this is a very famous example that already was uh, uh, over-exemplified, but uh, I'll, I'll do it as well. It's, uh, uh, it's um, a case based on uh, Riboro from 2016 that he showed that uh, when you try to learn a system to identify a husky and a wolf, uh, this ASCII is classified as a wolf, and, and when you apply the XAI system on it, you see that the main pixels that explain this classification are related to the snow. So uh, uh, simply the uh, input databases that contain a lot of uh, pictures of wolves were uh, in a snowy environment, and the system, of course, couldn't uh, 
identify that snow is not a feature of a, of a wolf, and this became a main feature. And picture like that enable us uh, to correct the uh, the system accordingly. So uh, this is one of the advantages to debug the models. Of course, you can validate uh, validate the model. The model you can better dispute it, and you can address those questions of. Uh, um, um, fairness in a better way, okay? Now, talking about the approaches, most of the approach uh, that uh, use XAI, or many of them, are based on surrogate modeling. So you have your data, you have your black box uh, model, uh, whether in neural networks or uh, um, it can be a random forest, whatever, and you, uh, you get the prediction out of the model and you use both the data and the prediction to construct a surrogate model that will represent the same output sometime locally, but will be able, uh, um, will capture the main feature and will be more explainable, so you can actually use the surrogate model to try and explain what were the reason of the, you know, complex uh, neural network to uh, reach certain decisions. So uh, this is the main, uh, uh, characteristics and, and they are either local AI, XI, XAI approaches, so uh, they are often used to analyze a case by case example. So they are very relevant to users that are non technical and need some explanation why a specific decision one was made based on uh, uh, a certain specific case or whether or not this person got a loan or not is related to the fact that he is uh, too young and uh, has uh, no credit history. So this is a, uh, a feature that uh, can help uh, this explainability and maybe the fairness. Uh, it is uh, uh, less relevant to the global XAI approach where you try to explain the entire model analysis in terms of the global feature importance. Here you are not concerned about specific case. What you want to do is to try and understand how the uh, uh, overall features, sometimes in a data set that contain thousands of features, which one of them are relevant to which areas, uh, and uh, sometimes you can generate uh, dependence plots out of it, and this is a, global, uh, glo a more global uh, XAI approach. Now, the local one, uh, as I mentioned, usually are um, connected to a specific uh, uh, location in the model, and uh, basically what you have, you have a loss function where you have the, the original model, F, and a, some approximated model in a certain area given some parameters, and you have a regularization function, and what you do, you try to, uh, you generate new data, and per each region you try to uh, minimize uh, both the size in the mod of the model and uh, the loss between the um, between F and G, between the uh, original black box model and the approximation, and you do it all together, um, and uh, apparently you can get a nice result. And this is again based on Ribeiro, uh, um, the original paper that uh, represented Lyme. What you see here, there a two-class problem over space. Of course, it's very non-linear and quite complex. However, for a certain case, for a certain region, you can actually separate well those two classes uh, with a linear a regression type of a model, and you can actually approximate it locally in around the different areas in, in, in space. So what you do, you, you uh, perturb the data, uh, you compute the proximity, you make a prediction, you uh, fit the, a simple model to that area, and, and, uh, and then you can correct it and extract an explanation out of it. And uh, again, uh, what you can see, and of course, you can apply different type of approximation. You can apply a regression model, or you can apply a simple uh, decision tree. And eventually, for this region, 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 you can get a very simple output in this case, you can identify, uh, this was a case uh, uh, trying to 
predict the household annual income, and you saw and in this uh, area the main feature was whether or not uh, this person uh, is married or not. And you see that this contributes positively to the income while the other contributed negatively. And you can uh, actually extract not only the main feature, but what if what uh, uh, um, rules that can help you uh, address other cases in the same region. And uh, you can apply it, of course, also to uh, uh, images. So again, uh, it's based on on the same publication, uh, here what uh, they try to do is to uh, classify a frog tree, and each time they generated a subset of the pixels, and for each subset they try to predict uh, the frog tree uh, with different uh, confidence level, and uh, eventually you try to uh, um, estimate a local weighted regression, finding the smallest set of pixels that can actually uh, maximize this uh, uh, confidence probability. And you end up with this subset, which is, of course, the, in this case, the face of the frog that is the most uh, minimal yet inf informative subset of feature that can help you uh, uh, address this task. So um, it's a general approach can be applied to uh, different type of uh, inputs uh, by different type of uh, um, simple regular, regularized models. Another approach, and it's of course local, so I should mention that you know part of the problem is that uh, you get a local information. It is much based on the data that you obtained. So if you get uh, new data, uh, actually the model uh, is not necessarily accurate enough. Um, is more focused on the model on that data. And ex extrapolations and general uh, idea about the future importance is quite problematic. The, uh, the nice part is that uh, in most of the cases, this is uh, computationally easy to apply and uh, in many cases provide good, good, uh, good outputs. Now a different approach is a, a more global approach based on the Shapley value uh, from, that is a known idea from game theory, where basically the main idea was to, you know, in the 50s by Shapley himself, was to find the average mar marginal contribution of a player that is part of a coalition. And again, I don't know uh, if maybe most of you know the example, but uh, you have a different you have different players here, A, B, A, B, and C, and you have different combination of coalitions. So each one can be by itself or with another player, up to the three player together. And for each set uh, for each set uh, coalition, you have a certain gain on or a cost. And in a moment, what we'll do, we'll if those players represent features. So in a game theory arena, those are costs or gains that uh, each player has to pay or to gain. In uh, XAI, they use this uh, approach to find the contribution of each feature. And the idea is that you build, you, you generate all the possible permutations of these three players in this case. And since each one of them, for each case, you have a cost, what you always compute is the marginal cost that the player has to, to, uh, to add. So, again, a very classic example is uh, if those numbers represent uh, the amount of money you need to pay for a taxi cab, you know. So, uh, to go home, uh, player A has to pay 80 bucks and B has to pay 56, depending on, of course, the location. But if they take it together, then A and B together will pay $80 because uh, the cab is to stop somewhere. Uh, in this case, by the way, B is uh, part of the root of A, so it doesn't have to pay anything. But A and C requires $85. And if all the three players go to that cab, they have to pay $90. So now what you do when you, when you comp 
when you compute uh, uh, the marginal contributions, again, one, one permutation is A, then B, and this, then C. So A play, pays 80, and then uh, A and B is 80, so B is, playing, is paying nothing. And then A, B, and C is 90, so uh, player C has to pay 10 for the extra uh, amount to complete it to 90. And similarly, you can see, so for example, if it was A and C and B, so A again is playing 80. A and C, the cost is 85, so he has to, player C has to pay another 5, and the complementary uh, sum to a 90 by C is 5. So you do all those permutations, this, exact, this is exactly the problem with uh, the sharp uh, value uh, computation because it requires all those uh, combinations that, of course, depends on the number of players, and in our case, depends on the number of features. And then you average them, and when you average them, you, s you get to see exactly how much each pay, uh, player should, uh, should pay. Uh, and uh, this can be uh, applied, as I mentioned, to features. And the nice thing, and the nice thing, sorry, and the motivation to uh, to use the Shapley value was that uh, it applies to uh, very clear um, properties or axioms that people uh, are associate with, uh, you know, fairness and explainability. So. It, all the contribution and, and add up to the uh, amount of the expectation based on all the players. It is symmetry. If there is a dummy player uh, that do not contribute, he will gain a value zero. And it is uh, you can uh, you can actually it's a linear system, so you can actually combine uh, two different games and obtain the same result. So based on all those uh, properties, uh, the sharp value. Uh, was also uh, selected later uh, to, to uh, be used uh, for explainable AI. And this is exactly the, uh, the same computation that we saw before. So here we have uh, the importance of each feature EI. So now those, uh, those players are represented by features. And what you do whenever you have a subset of feature denoted by this subset of feature S, you compute the output or the value based on that sub, sub, subset with ed, by adding the feature I and subtracting the value of uh, the same function without this uh, uh, with feature I. So this represents the difference in the values of the subset with and without the feature I and you uh, of course, compute it over all the combination, you average it, and then you get the uh, global importance of that feature. Now, it's not uh, local anymore. It is uh, global over all the space. And here again, the main problem was to compute all those uh, uh, contributions because in our world, of course, it means that uh, you have to run a, maybe a deep network based on a very large data set by extracting and adding features, which takes a lot of time. And people were trying to approximate it, either by uh, uh, some, com some, some kind of local models or by ev what they uh, often do is uh, um, uh, by randomly uh, uh, taking uniform samples from the space uh, and some other ideas. And, uh, including some combination with uh, Lime that we saw before. And uh, uh, SHAP concept is uh, exactly based on uh, the idea of Shapley with some approximations. And what you can get out of those uh, uh, calculations, as I mentioned, is the contribution of each feature. And the contribution here represents the change in the expected model prediction when we, you condition on, on uh, that specific feature. So you have uh, um, the overall uh, expectation is 24.4, and uh, what if you do not condition a certain feature, it will be 26.3, so you can actually measure the contribution of each feature. And again, when you apply it, uh, you can apply it to different 
type of problems. You, you, you see a text problem where you want to highlight those words uh, that uh, are explainable and the most important for the, the classification or for uh, the NLP task that you, are that you are given. You can look at two uh, different uh, features here, uh, sex and age, and see how their importance uh, interacts uh, under different values of uh, age and, uh, and uh, gender. And of course, you can apply it also to, uh, to pixels, to pictures, and see exactly what are the important pixels that represent the image. And again, the problem with that approach is the complexity. Uh, the fact that there is no one learning un technique that optimizes both the performance and explainability. And this is, again, a very famous space where you have different models in terms of accuracy and explainability. Of course, it doesn't work like that in reality. And in many cases, you can find that uh, some of the models that are uh, more accurate uh, uh, are actually uh, 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 controlled by less, uh, more explainable feature. But generally, this is, uh, um, you start with uh, very good models that are less explainable, like uh, neural networks, complex neural networks, and you can actually get uh, to a very explainable models like classification rules uh, that are less accurate. Uh, so no model actually is a, an optimal one. And as we mentioned, uh, we are limited in those models to, uh, uh, to the assumption that there is no multicollinearity effects in the data. So actually, many specific problems uh, will uh, obtain poor results with uh, the SHAP and uh, similar ideas. And, and definitely, the idea of uh, uh, the, the um, high order feature space or interaction that cannot be solved due to uh, those uh, uh, overall iteration that one has to do. And I talked only about feature space, but uh, what we try to do, and in a moment I will go to our research, is to address even uh, a more complex scenario of a time series of a stochastic process where you have different features, but they also differ in time. So then uh, you can either treat each, each uh, value in each time as a, as a random variable, but it explodes extremely fast and you cannot apply uh, those ideas. And of course, uh, all those cases are model dependent. So you always try to uh, address the question of uh, the feature importance with respect to the model uh, this model, the specific model that you are using, but uh, in many cases, many data scientists would be interested to understand whether or not the feature is important regardless of the model, since the model can be wrong and actually uh, do not take into consideration the, the feature as it should. So what we basically try to do is to address these two uh, cases of uh, dependence between time series in a way that is model independent. And uh, this was the paper uh, first by uh, Yuval Shalev and myself, and then a later paper uh, with uh, Amichai Piansky. So in the first paper, we considered a simple model that uh, take into uh, to account uh, time series and uh, um, explainability between time series. And, and there are many, many talking about uh, motivation, there are many cases where time series are a part of a machine learning AI system that is explainable. You can look at uh, you know, a financial system. You can look at uh, weather condition over uh, a synaptic map. You can uh, look at uh, you know, brain signals. You can talk about uh, uh, signals in a computer network. They all involve a series of uh, uh, measures, time series, stochastic processes that uh, actually affect each other. And the idea was to uh, measure 
these two uh, time series with uh, something that is uh, model independent, uh, like information, uh, uh, mutual information or information gain, and express it by uh, uh, the Kullback library divergence. So uh, you know that information gain is simply the Kullback library divergence between uh, the joint probability distribution and uh, uh, the marginals, uh, the multiplication of the marginals, and, and it represents the information between y and x. In our case, we want to apply it to uh, time series. So y and x are time series, and uh, this is exactly the same measure. So this is the past-future mutual information between two random variables. One represents the time series that uh, goes uh, tau f uh, lags to the future, and x tau p is another time series that goes uh, tau p lags uh, in the past. Of course, uh, one case is if they uh, represent the same time series and then you look for autocorrelation and so on, but in a general case, it can be a set of different random variables. And what you want to find is the Kullback libraries between the uh, future of uh, Y or the future time series with or without a knowledge about uh, the past time series, about X uh, tau P. And this gives you exactly the information that is related to uh, the past time series X tau P about the future Y tau F. Okay? And this just one thing to mention that this type of measure is called in the literature in different names. We, you can find it uh, uh, when, when tau f is larger than 1, it is sometimes called the predictive information. When tau f is equal to 1 and you predict only the next, uh, um, the next uh, 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 value, it is called transfer entropy, and, and it is actually addressed by different type of societies, but uh, they present a similar... Uh, measure and similar concepts. And the basic idea when people tried in the past to measure uh, the information between two vectors of random variable that can be uh, also time series is uh, just by uh, simply uh, the plug-in uh, measure by Cover and Thomas 2005. Basically what you do, you divide the space to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to small cubes, and you simply compute, uh, you approximate uh, both the marginal distribution and the joint distribution by, by counting, and then you can uh, directly evaluate the information uh, content between uh, Y and X. And there are a more sophisticated method, also based on, on some kind of uh, um, frequency sampling, but uh, based on K and, N, K and N, where instead of treating the space equally and divide it to equal bins, they use the fact that uh, you can define well clusters and, sub, and, and div sorry, divide the space to equiprobable cube, which makes uh, uh, it much uh, more efficient and more accurate. And these were the benchmark method, but here as well what you see is that uh, when you increase the alphabet size, when X and Y, their, uh, the value that they can take, uh, their alphabet grows, of course, uh, the number of computations that you need to take uh, grows very high. And it is even severe when, despite the fact that you have two time series that have uh, different uh, um, many values, in fact, there is sparsity, only very small instances or patterns of one time series will affect the other time series. So if you look at uh, the X vector, which is the past time series, and you look for those patterns that are informative in those tau f past time lags, and you divide it by the, all combina the uh, total combination of those uh, time lags, you find that it's uh, much smaller than one. So there is only a small subset that is informative. Um, uh, and this is a sparse condition. And uh, it happens uh, a lot in uh, real, uh, um, 
use cases. So for example, in the financial time series that, that uh, 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 we analyzed, we find that many times when you look at uh, long enough time series, only one to 5% of the patterns are informative between two financial time series. In that case, these two indices of uh, two banks uh, that are taken uh, one after the other. And the idea was, and, and this is the first model, later also the uh, neural network model, but the first model was to apply what we call the uh, uh, input-output context, which is based on uh, past work that uh, um, we partly contributed to uh, in the past, where basically you create a model that represents in the nodes you have uh, the output time series, and in uh, the edges, you have the uh, input time series. So, for example, this is uh, the, in this case, we have uh, three different outcomes to the output time series. So you can have uh, uh, either zero, one, or two. So you have uh, or A, B, and C, three values. And you see the, uh, this is the marginal distribution of Y. And then given uh, a specific uh, realization of the past time series. So this minus one represents the value of uh, uh, the input time series. If you had minus one in the input time series, the output time series distribution changes. And now instead of being 0 0.42, 0 0.16, 0 0.42, it changes to uh, this distribution and so on. So you can actually grow a tree but by looking at the past value of uh, the input time series and see how it affects the output distribution of uh, the output time series given uh, those values. And usually what you do, you grow such a three, and then you look at the differences between uh, the two distributions. You can trim out any distribution that is close enough, which is basically a re regularization uh, process because you don't want to keep a pattern that doesn't change uh, the distribution enough, okay? And the nice thing about it is uh, that what we found, and um, we didn't find it somewhere, although it seems very trivial, is that when you have this complex structure of these two time series, and you sum the kullback library divergence between all the nodes to uh, the root node, what you end up with is exactly the... Uh, um, the kullback libeler or the mutual information between time series X to time series Y. So again, what you do, you construct those uh, context trees, you trim, given a, a, a pruning constant C, you trim them, and then when you sum all the KL differences between those nodes to the uh, root node, you end up exactly with the mutual information, the correct mutual information between X and Y. And you can easily do it. If you, have, uh, if you create a simple example, you can easily see that uh, this is the case. And of course, when you don't have the ground truth, you can actually measure accurately the, um, um, the information contact between those time series. You don't, you don't depend on the model now. And... The nice thing is that you, all, you also end up with a descriptive idea of uh, how the different contexts affect uh, the output time series. Okay, so this was the main finding. And then when you get a new data set, what you can create as a simple algorithm, uh, you get two uh, time series or, you know, two sets of time series, inputs and output. You create those context trees, and then you calculate, you build them up to a point, you calculate the information content out of them, and then you start to play with the pruning constant such that the, uh, at certain point, the, uh, um, the second derivative uh, is uh, zero. So it means that you reach a, a point where you can actually trim that tree without, uh, um, so you trim that tree as long as you don't lose a lot of information. At some point you trim it too much and suddenly all the information that was in uh, time series X drops 
about time series wise drops. So you gradually trim the tree, and you all the all the time you uh, you monitor this uh, information that is basically represented by those sums, the weighted sum of the cool by elaborate divergence between the nodes and and the and the, uh, and the root of the trees. And uh, just to show you uh, one um, illustrative case, so we have uh, one time series uh, is X that has um, alphabet size between 20 to 90, so a large alphabet size uh, relatively. Of course, in images, it's even more. And you have the output Y. And in this case, artificially, what, uh, we, what we did is uh, uh, Y depends Y1 depends mainly on X1, and Y2 depends on X2. Of course, these are just uh, labels. You have many, many others, other labels of the input time series that do not affect uh, Y are simply noise. And there is a slight effect of X2 on Y1 and X1 on uh, Y2. Uh, so it's a very simple rule. And what you can see is that uh, when you apply it, um, and you start to increase the alphabet size, and you measure the errors in, in the correct mutual information, which in this case can be computed empirically uh, accurately because it's, uh, the theoretical distribution is known, you see that many of the methods that are based on KNN or plug-in, uh, they will uh, result in high error, while we have uh, quite... Uh, a, a good error fit in terms of uh, this uh, 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 IO, in, IO uh, context tree model. And now when you apply it to real data sets, it also behaves in a similar way. What you see here is the HSBC index. Um, so, um, you know, the American index that uh, uh, represents either a loss a gain or, um, you know, um, a solid uh, um, day where the index didn't change. So you have three values in this case. And you try to measure the information between other banks. You have Banks of America and so on, Deutsche and so on. And you, want to, you see how, which one of them as an input, as an input index will affect the uh, index of the HSBC. And what you see, first there is a, one bank that is, most, uh, is the most informative, uh, and this is uh, the Deutsche Bank. And by the way, we took this uh, uh, to banking people, and they could explain, of course, post-mortem exactly why it happens like that. But uh, this is one, one aspect of it. The interesting aspect is that regardless of, of the different indices that we used, and regardless of the amount of the actual information that you get out of them, when you talk about regularization, because what you see in the x-axis is the number of, uh, it's actually one of the pruning constants, so it's the number of uh, parameters. What you see is that in the beginning you can trim all those time series and you don't lose a lot uh, in terms of uh, uh, the information. Up to a critical uh, point, it's not zero, it's before zero. When you trim them, uh, immediately you get a, a sharp de decrease uh, of all of them, uh, since the important parameters were trimmed out of the model, and you know that this is, if you talk about now information gain, you should select those points as uh, the smallest uh, models that can represent well the information between these two time series. And you see the same behavior with different indices. And the nice thing is also that you can, uh, when you are left with a trimmed model, you can understand exactly what's going on. So, for example, if there is a stable period, there is a high chance that it will be stable. If there was a, uh, a drop in the index, you, you have a good understanding of how it will affect the other bank in, in, in the next day and so on. So, uh, you get to see uh, those patterns uh, as an explainable patterns that you understand what are the role the rules uh, or the rules that uh, actually affect those two time series. 
and I don't have time to go uh, over it, but the nice thing is that if you know the deterministic bottleness of, of uh, Tali Tishbi, that also control basically the size of the compression, the size of the model compression, and the information between the compressed model and the output uh, and the output value, when you have this beta as a um, regularization and scaling compression parameter, it works very similarly to this uh, C that I showed before, and you can see that uh, actually they also behave similarly. So again, I don't go, want to go to, into this direction, but uh, these type of models also uh, um, like resemble or collide with other uh, uh, similar models that are based on those ideas. Um, and, of course, um, what we can do is uh, to go further and to generalize those uh, context-free models to a more complex uh, network, in this case, uh, neural networks, it can be uh, variational autoencoders where you actually play with the data uh, and you autoencode it and see how the different features affect this decoding and measure the information. Or you can do it in a straightforward way. So you can have, a, for example, a set of uh, LSTMs where you have one time series affecting the second one and you can have a similar model, but this time you plug in two time series. And now you want to measure what is the difference in information between the output of uh, this neural network model that is based on one time series to the other one that is based on two time series. And then you can measure the contribution of, uh, of uh, the second time series of the, the time series here that is denoted by B. So it's a simple and straightforward idea like uh, Lime, okay? You can perturb the data, you can add more feature or like SHAP, and you can measure directly the difference and uh, assess what, how much information you gain out of it. And uh, uh, we, we are not the first to think about it, so in, uh, there were a series of work in 2018-19 that showed that uh, when you use these uh, uh, neural networks model to um, measure the, uh, this is the true mutual information between time series. You see that uh, if this is the KNN, uh, those neural network based models perform much better in terms of uh, uh, finding the uh, real mutual information value of the, the information content between these two time series. What uh, we did is uh, an extension of uh, this idea to measure not only the, uh, um, uh, the entropy, but also the conditional entropy, and to uh, uh, find in a better way, uh, more accurately, the information in those time series. Again, it's based on those uh, uh, networks model. And the outcome, and this is a, a paper that uh, was now su submitted to uh, ICML, in the outcome, uh, based on known data sets that uh, uh, were generated by uh, uh, those papers in 2018-19, what you see, uh, the true mutual information is the black line. And uh, this is how we perform. So we are very close to that. While other methods, including those that were based on uh, other neural networks, uh, are not only uh, uh, bias, but their vi variance is quite large. You see all those uh, blue area of variances uh, measure over iterations. So you get here m more accurate result and much more condensed and biased, and uh, sorry, and, and with uh, uh, smaller variance. And you can apply it also to, uh, uh, again, I don't have time, but to a more complex system, this is a uh, uh, the implementation of uh, our model to uh, a benchmark based on uh, um, on uh, new protein protein structure, and uh, what we did we played with uh, um, epsilon that uh, represents the relations and the dependency between those proteins, 
and we sl slightly change uh, uh, the threshold value where we consider those uh, proteins to be, or those uh, uh, um, molecules to be uh, uh, dependent on each other. And again, you can see that in terms of AUC, we obtain uh, 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 better results than before. So, and some other stuff, uh, you can see some uh, some uh, uh, spikes that represent, for example, in time series that, uh, for example, during uh, during um, period of stress, there is a much stronger dependency between time series than in other periods, and you can actually identify exactly those periods in, in the real data. Uh, so conclusion, uh, EXA is an important and emerging field of uh, research. It is uh, uh, crucial in terms of uh, uh, the challenges that are mostly related to, uh, you know, problems of scalability, sparsity, collinearity, and so and so on. Uh, I showed one specific model. Uh, it's not an AI model. It's simply a, a general a general uh, uh, information source based on the context tree that can measure accurately the mutual information between uh, a couple of uh, time series, uh, a pair of time series, and I showed also a case where we can generate it with uh, neural networks. Uh, it is related to other known resulting information uh, theory, and uh, many of those aspects are still unknown and, and are uh, calling for further research. In this research, uh, the main work was uh, done by Yuval Shalev, that I believe is not here, and uh, partially by Aviv, that is over there, with uh, Amichai Piansky, a uh, faculty member in, in uh, our department, Tel Aviv University. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We have a very short time, just for one question, uh, one question, and um, any questions? So I have one, and maybe the answer is too long for that, but uh, notions of causality for time series, like Granger causality and things like that, so yeah. there is a relation between these and the... Sure. So you have to uh, uh, pass even more serious tests to uh, address causality. In most of those cases, I uh, was addressing correlation or dependence, so to speak. Uh, all those causality tests can actually be also applied in some of the frameworks that I showed. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you.